The world is so full of confusing ideas that we can no longer answer very simple and basic questions such as what is a particle? Quantum mechanics, which is claimed to be one of the most tested theories in physics, provides no reasonable explanation for this simple question. It tells us that sometimes matter behaves as a wave and then some other times as particles. Einstein said, we are inclined to accept the idea that light sometimes behaves as a wave, but sometimes as a particle, and sometimes as both. If this is true, it should mean that light has a mind of its own, with which it can decide where and when to reveal itself to us as either a wave or a particle or both. First of all, it is preposterous to think that light has a mind of its own. Second, if you are asked if light is a wave or a particle, and you say it is a wave and it is a particle, and it is both a wave and a particle, that is just a confused answer, and it is no answer at all. In the best case scenario, a dilemma arises which should not be the case when explaining nature. In this video, I will put a spotlight on this to show where the confusion comes from, which will enable us to finally decide whether light is a wave or a particle, and whether anything in the universe can exhibit both properties. We should be very clear about this. It is an entirely different thing to say that something behaves as some other thing and to say that it is the other thing. This is the key thing that modern science uses to confuse us. Let me give a few examples of this that they use. In special relativity, an observer in a moving train claims that a ball that he drops falls in a straight line while an observer outside the train claims that the ball traces an inclined path. Spatial relativity claims that the two observations must be valid, and so they develop some kind of math for that that has turned the world upside down. But what happens in nature is independent of who observes, and so there must be an absolute path that the ball will travel, regardless of the observer. In my opinion, this is a very simple thing to resolve. The ball gets its energy both from the engine thrust of the train and from gravity, and so it must move in the direction of the resultant force, which is inclined. That is the actual path that it would take. What the observer in the train is claiming is that the train does not exert any force on the ball, which is a big lie, because that is the only condition in which it will move only vertically downwards under the influence of gravity alone. That is just what will appear to be, but is not actually the case. The path of an object is determined by the, by the result and force on it not by how you chose to observe it. This is no different from observing a piece of rod immersed in water and thinking that it is bent, when in fact it is not. An observer outside the water will see the rod as bent, but an observer inside the water will see a perfectly straight rod. Why don't they try to reconcile those two observations as well? I think that will form a new branch of physics entirely. Imagine two barriers separated by a fixed distance. The bottom contains a liquid of density rho. Above the surface of the liquid is a smooth surface on which we can roll spherical balls. Let's attach two identical energy detectors on this side of the wall and energy sources on the other side of the other wall. 
One of the sources is a vibrator to create waves on the liquid and the other is some kind of propeller to propel the balls of the smooth surface. For our simplicity, let's assume that there is no damping in the liquid, no friction on the surface, and that all collisions are perfectly elastic. Let's start with the wave part. We create a cycle of wave that travels from the source to the detector. A wave is an excitation in a particle field that transmits energy from one point to another. What you see as the wave travels is a ridge raised above the surface of the liquid traveling to the right. Let's take a few seconds to really look at one cycle of wave. Notice that there is no liquid in this half of the cycle while this other half has risen above the liquid surface. It is obvious that the particles of the missing portion of the liquid has gone onto the other half, reason why the other portion of the liquid maintained their level. So, this one cycle of wave is like a spherical ball of liquid particles traveling at the speed of the wave. So, let's say we can make this ball solid while maintaining its density. We let this be the sphere on the smooth surface. Using the vibrator, let's set up a wave on the liquid such that it travels to the right with speed v. At the same time, we switch on the propeller so that it propels our sphere to the same velocity v to the right such that both the wave and the ball travel to the respective detectors. When they strike the detectors, their kinetic energies are recorded. Since the wave and the ball have the same number of particles and density, their masses are therefore the same. Since they travel at the same speed, the momenta should also be the same. Now, what do you think the energy reading on the detectors will be? That's right, the same. If this whole system was concealed in something like a box, such that you can only see the readings on the detectors, it, it will be impossible to tell whether it was a wave or a particle that struck a given detector. So. Two cycles of wave is identical to two balls moving with the same velocity, or one ball which is twice as large. Three cycles equal to three balls, and so on. If you like the video, please press that like button. And if you are visiting us for the first time, click on that subscribe button as there are more interesting videos like this to come and you wouldn't miss out. The distance between two consecutive balls represents the wavelength, and this depends on the frequency of the source. The greater the frequency of the propeller, the greater the number of balls that will be pushed in a given time, and hence the shorter the separation between the balls. This is exactly the same for the wave. The greater the frequency of the vibrator, the greater the number of cycles of wave produced per unit time, and hence the shorter the wavelength. As we have seen, both these waves and the balls are made of particles that are traveling with velocity v, so they carry momentum. In a given amount of time, if we read a short wavelength between the balls or the cycles of wave, then this means that there are particles traveling, and this means more momentum will be recorded. So, the smaller the wavelength, the more the momentum, and vice versa. Mathematically, we say that linear momentum is inversely proportional to wavelength. Taking away the proportionality sign, we have P equal to 
A on lambda. From unit analysis, the units of A is equal to the units of B times the units of lambda. Insert in the units yield this. So, units of A is kilograms meter squared per second, which is the same as joules second, which is the unit of the Planck's constant, H. So, we can write P equal to H on lambda, which is the De Broglie equation. This equation is true regardless of whether we are talking about the solid balls or the waves on the liquid. The Planck's constant here is just the proportionality constant, and it only takes the value you know if the wave we are dealing with is an EM wave. To get its value for any situation, like this one, you will have to do the experiment. Also, it is clear that momentum is directly proportional to frequency. Mathematically, we have this. So, P is equal to B times F, where B is the constant of proportionality. The units of B can be expressed as follows, which is equal to kilograms per meter. By this unit, what does B represent? Since B is a constant, let us try combining the two obvious constants, V and H. That is, the speed of the wave and the Planck's constant. The combination H over V will give the units of B. So, we can write P equal to HF on V. The energy recorded by the detector in a given time depends on the total number of balls or waves that are struck it. This means that the higher the frequency, the more the number of particles that will strike the detector and hence more energy. This means that energy is directly proportional to frequency. Mathematically, we have this which transforms into this when we take away the proportionality sign. To get the value of C, you have to do the experiment. Set the vibrator or propeller to different frequencies and for each frequency, measure the energy reading after say 10 seconds. From the data, you can plot a graph of energy against frequency from which you can calculate the slope. The slope of this graph is equal to C. From the equation of the slope, we see that the unit of C is joules second, which is the unit of the Planck's constant. So, for EM waves, we can write E equal HF, which is the famous Planck-Einstein equation. It is obvious that energy is also inversely proportional to wavelength, which can be represented mathematically as this. So, E is equal to D on lambda. Checking by units, you will notice that D is equal to H times V. So, E is equal to HV on lambda. From what we have observed, it should be clear to you by now how a wave behaves as a particle when you measure it, a phenomenon common in quantum mechanics, and how a particle behaves as a wave. The equations whether it is a wave or a particle are indifferent. This is the reason why the whole idea gets mixed up in quantum mechanics. The devil is always in the details. Measuring something means you need a detector for that thing to strike, that is, interact with it. And we have seen that the act of striking alone cannot tell you whether something is a particle or a wave. 
So when you use a detector in a quantum mechanics lab to measure electrons or photons, the result will always seem like they are the same. That is why quantum physicists think that photons, which we know are waves, are particles when they are measured, and electrons which we know are particles are waves when you are not looking at them. In my opinion, this is the worst science of all time. It is laughable to suggest that nature behaves differently when you are looking at it, but changes behavior when measurements like what I have given in this video are made. I think the idea of measurement should be clear from my explanation. Please don't forget to subscribe and like the video. Throw your thoughts in the comment section below. See you next time on the Classical Universe.